Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Michael. Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, part three of four of our uh, online uh, COVID edition of hydronics training. Uh, we certainly appreciate everybody getting up early to attend this and looks like most people made it despite the changing uh, daylight savings time. I don't know if that affects you, John. Do you get it caught does. up in that? Yeah, we nice. get caught up nice. in it and we, we got our first seasonal snowstorm this morning here too. So. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd call it a storm, but we got a little bit of snow here as well. So um, just quick housekeeping, everybody. There's some handouts today that are uh, there for download. Um, we have the buffer tank application manual that John wrote for FlexCon, which is going to be very relevant to this training session. And then we also have Coletti's Hydronic 17, which John also wrote on thermal storage and hydronic systems. The last handout for everybody is a really good handout uh, for the Black Birch Sustainable Building Case Study. Uh, this is a project where uh, a project named, a uh, product part me named Raul Panel was used in a, a project and it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, product to use. Uh, obviously, we want to uh, thank all of our sponsors uh, who have helped to make this training happen. Uh, without them, uh, John and I wouldn't be able to do this. So we certainly appreciate them participating and we appreciate everybody attending. And on that note, John, I'm uh, gonna hand it off to you. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and uh, welcome back, folks. Uh, as Mike was saying, uh, session number three out of four of our COVID era mini series on hydronics training. And what we're going to talk about today are, uh, well, thermal storage tanks and buffer tanks. Uh, we're gonna talk about sizing them. We're gonna talk about what they do. We're going to compare different types of piping assemblies. Uh, it turns out there's several different ways that you can pipe up a buffer tank. Now, um, before we get into it, one of the slides, one of my favorite slides to show in just about any presentation on hydronics is about how water is vastly superior to air in terms of conveying heat. And we use a physical property called heat capacity. And it's, it's a very simple idea. If you have a cubic foot of a material, any material you see on this list, a cubic, imagine a cubic foot of that. How many BTUs does it take to raise that cubic foot one degree Fahrenheit? And for water, it takes about 62 BTUs to raise a cubic foot of water one degree Fahrenheit. And when we compare that to air, Air is a really lousy thermal storage material. It only takes 18 thousandths of one BTU. That's again, 18 thousandths of one BTU to raise a cubic foot of air one degree Fahrenheit. So when we do a comparison, one of the things I like to do is a ratio. How much better is one versus another? Well, we'll divide the 62.4 by the 0 0.018 and we get if we round that off, we get almost 3,500 times more heat storage in a given amount, a given volume of water compared to the same amount of air. And, and this is really why hydronics works. It's why we can use a three quarter inch tube as an example, rather than a 14 inch wide, eight inch high duct, because the material that we're passing through our, and I use the general term conduit to mean either a duct or a pipe, the material we're passing through there is so much uh, better at storing heat uh, when it's water compared to air. Now, this is also uh, relevant to today because of heat storage. So again, let's compare water to some other materials that over time have been used to store heat. And again, we're gonna assume water is kind of our benchmark. We're gonna call that 100%, okay? If we go to concrete, and you know, concrete is a great material for construction, and it does have a place for storing heat. It's been used in a lot of passive solar buildings. Many of you have done floor heating systems, slab on grade buildings, and you know there's a lot of energy stored in that slab. But when we compare it to water, it's only about 47% as good as water. Its heat capacity is 29.4 uh, BTUs per cubic foot. So a given volume of water can store a little over two times as much as the same volume of concrete. And I say that I've actually had people say, well, when you build a storage tank, why don't you just fill it with concrete and put some tubing in there and circulate water through the tubing rather than just you know fill it with water? Well, uh, 
uh, there's really no point in doing that. You've got twice as much storage if you work with water compared to concrete. And another material that comes up is sand. How good is sand for storing heat? Well, sand is basically ground up rock. And there's actually in a, in a given sample of sand, there is a lot of air. And you can see here, the uh, heat capacity of sand is only about 9.5 BTUs per cubic foot per degree Fahrenheit. So water is almost, well, it's 6.6 .6 times better than sand. So don't fill up a storage tank with sand. And you're probably thinking, you know, who would do that? Well, way back when I first got involved with heating system design, uh, it was a, uh, I'll call it the early solar era. And people were doing things like this. This is called a rock bin. And imagine building this big chamber in your basement with concrete blocks and culvert pipe and everything else and filling it up with rocks and basically circulating air from solar collectors through those rocks and then uh, circulating air through those rocks to take that heat and put it in your house. Well, uh, it's not that good as far as thermal storage. And the other thing, you really want to breathe the air that goes through a pile of rocks every day. It's, it's not, I don't think it's that sanitary. So the sand bed thing and the rock bin really uh, kind of faded from, from uh, history. So don't do that, stick with water, okay? Now, one of the, the very fundamental equations, and you can use this anytime you're trying to calculate how much energy is in a given volume of water based on its temperature, or I should say how much its temperature changes. We call this sensible heat quantity equation. Sensible heat is simply heat that you can detect by a temperature change. Okay. And the formula there, it says it's 8.33 times the volume of the water times the change in temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you could modify this for uh, degrees Celsius, uh, you would basically just change that 8.33 factor. Uh, what is the 8.33? It's the number of BTUs that it takes to raise a gallon of water one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, so here's a couple quick examples. Let's say we're going to take down here 500 gallons of water at room temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're going to raise that water up to 180. How much energy has been stored? Well, if we just run it through our equation here, 500 gallons, and then our change in temperature right here, um, 458,000 BTUs, that's a lot of heat. That would heat a house for several hours if, if you have a system that could do that. And this is not atypical of something like a cordwood gasification boiler or potentially a commercial application with a pellet boiler. And you can use this equation in reverse too. If you're going to chill down water, okay, how much heat has to be removed? Well, it's the same equation. It's uh, again, just do the temperature change. If we went from room temperature down to 40 degrees, we would extract 125,000 BTUs per hour. And there are some systems that use chilled water storage. They use off-peak electricity with a heat pump or a chiller and bring the, uh, they actually go a step farther. Not only do they chill the water down, they freeze it into ice. And that, that's a huge thermal storage effect. You don't see that in residential as much. It's plausible, but it has been used in commercial systems where there are significant off-peak electrical rates available. Okay. Now, let's, let's look at an example. I wanna show you a system that could be set up and constructed today. It's, uh, it's using a low mass boiler. Let's say it's a copper tube boiler, conventional boiler. And over on the left, you see there's an indirect tank. And over on the right, you've got several zones. We've got six zones that are all independently controlled. And we've got a diverter valve here. Uh, the way the controls would be set up if the indirect tank is calling for heat, the diverter valve takes, uh, the tank gets priority. So the flow goes over here, comes back, goes through the boiler and so forth. Assuming the tank is satisfied, the diverter valve goes to the other position and that would make the flow available to any of these zones. Now, let's say that a zone comes on, but it's a small zone. It's a morning like this morning. And we have uh, maybe a panel radiator or it could be floor heating, you know, what, whatever the heat emitter is, it's only drawing 2,500 BTUs per hour. Uh, 
and we fire the boiler. Let's say we wire the end switches of all those zone valves to a typical multi-zone relay center, and we fire the boiler. And this boiler is an on-off boiler. It's sized at 75,000 BTUs per hour. When it's on, that's what it produces. When it's off, it's zero. So you can see we've got a huge discrepancy here, a big difference between the rate of heat production at 75,000 BTUs per hour versus the rate of heat dissipation, 2,500. So where does that extra 72,500 BTUs per hour go? Well, it goes into the mass of water between the heat source and whatever that active heat emitter is. And let's assume that we have the equivalent of five gallons of water there, okay? We've got a little bit of metal mass, but uh, metal mass is pretty minimal in terms of its thermal effect. But let's say between the boiler, the piping, the heat emitter, we've got five gallons of water. And let's say the controller on the boiler is set for a delta T of 20. In other words, it comes on at some temperature, and when it gets 20 degrees warmer than that temperature, it shuts off, okay? Let's figure out how long that boiler is going to run. And it's you can see I'm using the equation that we just started with, okay? 8.33 BTUs per gallon per degree Fahrenheit. We've got five gallons of water and we've got a temperature rise of that five gallons of water of 20 degrees. So basically we just equate that, how long would a 72,500 BTU per hour input take to raise that 20 degrees. And if you solve that out, it's 42 seconds, 42 seconds. So that boiler, in theory, it would cycle in less than one minute, it would have reached its upper temperature limit and shut off. Uh, we have actually seen boilers cycle for less than a minute. And um, obviously that's not a good thing from the standpoint of efficiency. It's not a good thing from uh, the life expectancy. Uh, on things like igniters in boilers. It's really not good for any equipment, any mechanical equipment or electrical equipment for that matter to turn on and off that frequently. So uh, we're gonna have uh, short cycling, right? Now let's size a buffer tank. And this is specifically for an on off heat source. So this could be for a boiler, like an oil boiler, an on off gas boiler, uh, propane, it could be a heat pump that has a simple on off compressor, any kind of an on off heat source. And the formula over here calculates a volume for the tank, and it's based on several things here. And you see the list of what, what's in this formula. Well, the heat output of the heat source in BTUs per hour. And we're, from that, we're going to subtract any heat dissipation that has that happens to be on at the same time as the boiler or the heat source, okay? Now, you might not have any load on. If that was the case, the second term right here would be zero. And we divide by 500, that is related to water as a storage material. And we're also dividing by the temperature rise in the buffer tank from when, it, when the heat source turns on to when the heat source turns off, okay? So let's do an example. Let's say we've got a 75,000 BTU per hour non-modulating boiler. It's an on-off boiler. And we want to have a minimum burner runtime of 10 minutes. Now, 10 minutes is something that I, I think over a number of years has just kind of been accepted as constituting kind of the minimum acceptable runtime. It's, it's not necessarily a scientifically established number, but it's a reasonable number. We all know that one or two minutes is definitely too short. And we can go for a longer period of time. We, we could size a tank that would keep a boiler running for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but we're gonna have a very large tank, very expensive. Uh, let's say that our load that happens to be on at the same time, our, our basically our smallest load in the system is 2000 BTUs per hour, okay? And we're gonna set up the controls so that the, Heat source comes on when the buffer tank temperature is 120 and it stays on all the way up to 180. That's a pretty wide temperature swing, okay? And of course, you can play with these numbers to your heart's content and, and find out what the volume is. If we put those numbers into the formula, 
we end up with about a 24 gallon buffer tank. And the reason that tank is relatively small is because we have such a wide temperature swing. We're, we're heating from 120 to 180, that's a 60 degree rise. Quick question, if that was only a 30 degree rise from 120 to 150, what would that do to your number? Well, it would double it. You'd be up to roughly 48 or, you know, I'll round it off to 50 gallons. So this is a formula that's very easy to work with. And you can, you can change the delta T, you can change the time requirement for the buffer tank to be on and just calculate out what your buffer tank size is. And remember, you can always go up in terms of a larger buffer tank. You, you could go smaller. Uh, you're simply going to have a shorter runtime. Okay. Now, I modified that formula a little bit if you have a modulating heat source. And this is based on the assumption that the heat source can modulate down to some minimum stable firing rate. And so the only thing that's different is this term right here. Instead of just the peak output of that heat source, it's the minimum. And the assumption is that the heat source could go down to that minimum stable firing rate and remain on at you know, reasonable operating efficiency. And we'll do another example. Let's say it's 75,000 BTU per hour peak output, but we have a five to one turndown ratio here, okay? And I just arbitrarily said, we wanna keep the burner on for 15 minutes. And our concurrent load is that same towel warmer at 2000 BTUs per hour. Uh, we're gonna turn the, the heat source on when the buffer tank drops to 110, and we're gonna turn it off at 130. Now that's only a 20 degree rise, okay? And again, we put the numbers in, we're at roughly 20 gallons of buffer, okay? And you might think, gee, that was only a 20 degree rise. How come the buffer tank is still relatively small? Well, it's because we're assuming the heat source would turn on and very quickly drop down to its minimum stable firing rate, okay? So again, we can uh, use this formula uh, or the previous formula to get a quick sizing on a buffer tank, okay? Now, we're gonna do a poll, couple poll questions this morning. So I'll read this and then Mike's going to uh, tabulate it. So take a, it only takes about 30 seconds to process these poll questions. So how many mm -hmm. of your zo zoned hydronic systems use buffer tanks? This is the test to see if Mike's still paying attention, right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, again, the, the intent here, think about a zoned system where you've got, I didn't put how many zones, but maybe four, five, six zones. Are you using a buffer tank on a system like that? So we'll take a few seconds. We'll wait for those results to come in. Yeah, we're at about 70% people voted. We'll, we'll give it another uh, 10 seconds and we'll see All right. what the results are. I don't think we made it to 100% votes yet, John. We've gotten close to all these polls we've been doing. Okay. All right, two more seconds and then we'll be at 75% and I'm going to stop it. All right. So the results are in. Uh, how many of your systems use buffer tanks? 18% uh, of people uh, said all of them. 16% said over 50%. 53% said under 50%. And interestingly, 14% said never. Okay. And it is possible to do a zone system without a buffer tank. I, I don't want to imply that you can't do that. Uh, the, the key is going to be the modulation of the heat source in comparison to what your minimum zoning is. Uh, I mean, if you have a large uh, slab heating system and you only have two zones out there or one, you know, two zones, uh, you can get by without necessarily having a buffer tank in a system like that. The flip side is also true. If you have a low mass heat emitter system, baseboard, fan coil, something like that, panel rads, and you have extensive zoning, even with a modulating heat source, uh, it's a question I ask quite often during training, how many how many contractors, installers have seen short cycling modulating condensing boilers? And you'd be amazed, a lot of 
people have seen that as I have. So just because a boiler or a heat source, it could be a heat pump, just because it can modulate down, let's say five to one, uh, is not a guarantee that you can do a system without a buffer tank. It really comes down to how many zones and how much thermal mass each one of those zones represent. Okay, let's keep going. Let's start with what I call the classic buffer tank piping. And, and I'll refer to this as a four pipe buffer tank configuration. We have two pipes coming in from our heat source, uh, the hot pipe going in the top of the tank, return going back from the lower portion of the tank. And then we have a uh, another high uh, upper portion of the tank pipe feeding our load and we're returning back to the bottom. So this is, again, this is the classic. We've done many systems over the years like this. Uh, here's the basic idea, what's going on with flow. We've got a loop from the heat source to the buffer tank, and we have another loop from the buffer tank out to the... And one of the things I'll say about this, all the energy from the heat source that makes it to the load has to pass through the buffer tank. There's no way to bypass the buffer tank in a situation like this. So what are the advantages? Well, this can provide extremely good hydraulic separation between this circulator here on the heat source and the circulator up here for the load. Um, if you do a buffer tank like this, you do not need to put in a hydraulic separator. We have seen schematics come through where designer has come out of the buffer tank and then put in a pump and gone to a hydraulic separator and then put in another pump to go from the hydraulic separator to the load. Uh, you know, it, it burns, it just burns money. You don't really need to do that. The, the buffer tank is going to give you a really good hydraulic separation. The other thing that is nice about a four pipe configuration is the mass of the tank, the thermal mass of the water in that tank is, I, I use the word engaged. It's always online. It's always working for you. There's no inadvertent way that you can uh, bypass the thermal mass of that tank. Now, that can be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. And I'll, I'll talk about that more when we get into the other piping configurations. So what are the disadvantages? Well, let's say the buffer tank is relatively cool. You know, maybe it's been several hours since it's been on or it's a startup after a long setback. Uh, if that tank is cooled down, it's going to delay heat transfer to the load because basically you've got to warm up that tank. All right, you're going to get some lukewarm, I'll say lukewarm temperatures out to the load initially because the warmer water is going to tend to stay in the upper portion of the tank, but you're also going to get mixing within the tank and that is going to bring that temperature down initially. And if that's a large tank, that could be several hours before that tank is back up to its normal temperature, okay? The other disadvantage of a four pipe has to do with maintaining stratification of temperature within the tank. And we're gonna talk about this more in a minute, but I will tell you, it's desirable to have temperature stratification in a tank. That is the hottest water at the top, the coolest water at the bottom. And one of the ways that that tends to get broken up, and again, this tends to be inadvertent, is a high flow rate coming in up here. A high flow rate coming into the tank tends to stir the water inside the tank and that will mix it. And what that does is it, it destroys or partially destroys temperature stratification. So. When we talk about these other buffer tank piping configurations, one of the things that we're trying to do is preserve temperature stratification, okay? Now, let's talk about it, okay? Good temperature stratification preserves what's called the exergy of the heat available in the tank. And I, I think there's only two people <laughs> that do hydronics training that really talk a lot about exergy. Robert Bean uh, introduced me to this word years ago. I had never heard of it. And Robert's a big fan of, of exergy. And it's, it's a very important concept. It has to do not with the quantity of energy in the tank. It has to do with what we call the quality or the usability of that energy in the tank. And to demonstrate it, here's a tank that is stratified. We've got 120 degree water at the top, 
and we've got 100 degree water at the bottom. And let's assume we have some kind of what we call a temperature profile from top to bottom. And that, that's just simply, if we were to take a thermometer and go down inch by inch through this tank and chart what those temperatures are, that's called a temperature profile. And typically we get a symmetrical profile. So if that's the case, the average water temperature in that tank would be the average of those two numbers. It would be 110 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Now let's take the same tank and pipe it differently. We're bringing hot water in the top and we're creating this vertical flow jet, all right? And we're doing the same thing down at the bottom with the return water. We're bringing cooler water in and we're spraying it up into the bottom there. And you can see these little curls in here represent turbulence and mixing inside the tank. So assuming we had good mixing inside the tank, our average temperature is 110 degrees, top and bottom and middle. So from the standpoint of purely how much energy both tanks contain, they're essentially, they are the same, okay? They're the same. If we use that sensible heat quantity equation and we use 110 over here as the average and 110 over here, we're gonna get exactly the same number. But I'm gonna ask you a question now. Let's say we have a load that at some time, at some given moment, we need 115 degree water to go to the load. Which tank can supply 115 degree water? Well, it's only the tank over here. It would go through some kind of mixing process, blending a small amount of cool water, and we would have our 115 degree water. We cannot make 115 degree water with a tank full of 110 degree water. Which tank could supply a load that at the time only requires 111 degree water? Again, it would be the tank on the left. So even though the quantity, the number of BTUs in both tanks is the same, the tank on the left still gives us more potential to use that energy. Now, I'm sure some of you might be saying, well, yeah, but that's only for a short period of time. And that's true. You know, once we deplete that temperature down to 115 or 114, we can't use it, but still that's an advantage. So a stratified tank gives us the ability to extract and utilize that energy uh, in, in a distribution system that a fully mixed tank really cannot uh, provide that same option. So that's, and there's, you know, there's whole books written on this. You, you can get into the mathematics of exergy and, and so forth, but very simply, it's the idea of preserving the usefulness of that thermal energy, okay? Now, one of the projects that I've been working on for several years, I've been working down here in New York State with uh, an organization called NYSERDA, and they've been doing a lot of work with pellet boilers. And this is a 500 gallon ASME pressure certified tank. It has insulation on it, and it's installed at a uh, college campus, and they cannot get any temperature stratification in this tank. And you see these little yellow things on the side of the tank here. These are thermocouples. This tank is heavily in instrumented because it's part of a research project. And the uh, person doing the research says, we, we can't even get one degree Fahrenheit temperature stratification in this tank. So what's going on? Well, these little arrows down here at the bottom are kind of a prelude. I'll show you another photo. This is looking at the bottom of the tank. That's a three inch pipe coming back from a building that's bringing the return water back. And basically it's all going straight up into the bottom of the tank. This piping over here is just the dead end. It's a drain valve. You see there's a cap here and a ball valve, like it looks like a pressure gauge. Uh, that's just to drain the tank out. So effectively we're shooting a three inch pipe straight up into the bottom of that tank. And that tank is maybe six and a half, seven feet tall. Imagine this, imagine it was a glass tank and you could look into the tank and imagine you have water coming back in the bottom and at a moment you just inject some blue dye into that return stream and watch what happens as that blue dye comes up into that bottom connection of the tank. Can you kind of picture that? You're going to get a nice plume of blue dye spreading out inside that tank and that's the problem. That's why they're not getting temperature stratification, okay? So 
basically the, the takeaway is we don't want to create vertical flow jets in a tank. So we don't want to shoot water straight into a tank like this from the top. And I will give you an exception if you have a baffle plate built in right here that can deflect that, break up that vertical flow jet, okay? But if it's just an open tank shell, as it's shown here, this is not a good idea. Neither is this, okay? Now, you can bring the water into the bottom of the tank if there is a some type of a flow diffuser. And there's different designs for flow diffusers. One of the simplest is simply a circular plate that doesn't go all the way out to the edge of the tank. So this jet impinges uh, against the bottom of that plate. And basically what that does is it breaks up the vertical velocity of that flow and allows it to move sideways and eventually moves up through these spaces on the side over here. Okay, you could do the same thing up at the top. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that, all right? So the takeaway is don't create vertical flow jets in your storage tanks. Now, this is an engineer's drawing. This is again for a, a large commercial pellet boiler system. And what this is, these are three thermal storage tanks, 600 gallons each. I'll show you a photo of this project. Um, the engineer's drawing right here calls for a flow rate at this point in the system of 180 gallons per minute. So we get 180 gallons per minute moving through a three inch pipe. And let's follow where that pipe goes. Well, it goes right into the bottom of this tank. This is just a valve, service valve. Comes over here, goes up into the bottom of this tank, and likewise, it goes up into the bottom of this tank. And you'll see there's reverse return piping here. So the engineer is trying to balance the flows out through these three tanks. So we would have 60 gallons per minute each going up into the bottom of those tanks. That is going to destroy stratification in those tanks. Now we did catch this before this got built and we convinced the designers to put uh, plate diffusers into the bottom of these tanks to avoid creating these vertical flow jets. And I show this simply as an example if you're working on a system that has thermal storage built into it, um, watch for these details. You, you don't want to create these vertical flow jets that break up stratification, just the opposite. Okay. Now, we've talked about four pipe tanks. Let's talk about an alternative, and it's called a two pipe buffer. Okay. And the key concept in a two pipe buffer that differentiates it from the four pipe is the load piping is connected between the heat source and the tank rather than over on the right side of the tank. It seems like a small, subtle difference, but it, it is important. And I'll, I'll tell you my experience with this, I had never seen or heard of a two pipe buffer tank until about well, roughly seven, seven years ago. And we got involved with the pellet boiler project with NYSERDA and we started doing research on European pellet boiler systems. And we saw uh, several schematics that showed this type of a tank configuration. And my, my first reaction being egotistical, oh, look, at the Europeans got the piping on the tank wrong. And then I really started to look at it more and think about it. And uh, we found out that actually, no, I was wrong in my assumption. There are a couple key advantages to this, okay? Uh, one is that when the heat source and the load are operating at the same time, it's possible to send heat directly from the heat source to the load without going through the buffer tank. Now, how could that help you? Let's say the buffer tank has cooled down. It's been several hours. This is going to expedite getting heat to the load, okay? How much of that flow goes out? Well, it, it's all dependent on flow rate, and I'll, I'll show you some examples in a minute, okay? The other advantage is when the heat uh, source and the load are operating at the same time, the flow rate going in and out of the buffer tank is only the difference between those two flow rates. All right, instead of sending a flow rate directly, all the flow from the heat source directly through the tank, you're only going to put into the tank the difference. And we'll, we'll put some numbers on that that can reduce the flow velocities in the tank, which helps stratification. The other thing, um, we still can re retain good hydraulic separation. And a, a very key element, and I'll stress this again in another slide, is to keep these headers 
where the, the load piping takes off. We want these headers short and as close to the tank as possible. We don't want to take this load off way back over here because we want the, the piping that's in common to both the heat source circuit and the load circuit to be as low in pressure drop as possible. So by keeping these two T's close to the tank, essentially it's the pressure drop through the tank, which is extremely low. So we're going to still retain good hydraulic separation. So what's the bad news? Well, the disadvantage. With certain control scenarios, the tank mass, the thermal mass of the water in that tank can be disengaged from the process. Imagine a situation where we've got 10 gallons a minute coming in from the heat source, and we also have 10 gallons a minute going out to the load. Under those conditions, there's, in theory, there's no flow through the buffer tank. And if we set up those conditions where we have equal flow rates from the heat source and the load, and we have a thermostat out there in the room that eventually gets satisfied, it's going to shut off this process before this tank has really absorbed any heat or given up any heat. And we don't want that. So one of the key things, and I'll, again, I'll stress it later, if you're working with a two pipe buffer, you should be controlling your heat source based on the tank temperature, not a thermostat or a, you know, not a group of thermostats. Have a tank sensor. In some cases, it might even be more than one sensor, but you're gonna turn the heat source on and off independent of those thermostats that are controlling the zones, whether they're zone pumps or zone valves. Now, another disadvantage of a two pipe, but it's something that can be corrected, is imagine we have cool fluid coming back here from our load and being optimists, we say, well, the fluid's smart enough to know what to do right here. It, it, it takes a turn to the right, it goes up through the buffer tank and it pushes nice warm water back into this T and it sends that warm water back up to the load. It'd be great if we could train water to do that. Uh, unfortunately, there's another pathway, a possible pathway, and that would be back here. Now, I haven't shown it, but this would be going back through the heat source. And let's say the heat source is a boiler and it's off, or it could be a heat pump and it's off. We're sending water, and remember, even though I've drawn this as a blue line, this is still warm water. Water. It still has energy in it relative to room temperature. So we're going to send that up through this inoperating, or that's not a word, but a heat source that's off. And we're going to dissipate heat into the mechanical room or wherever that heat source is. And that's going to cool that fluid down a little bit. And then we're going to mix it back in with some of the flow that's come through the tank. So if we mix it at this point, we're, we're bringing the supply temperature that's ultimately going out to our heat emitters. We're bringing it down. We don't want to do that. So we need a way to prevent flow that's coming back from going through an inoperable heat source, okay? A heat source that's off. And there's there's several ways you can do that, all right? Now, again, here's a comparison of flow rates between a two-pipe buffer on the left and a, and a four-pipe buffer over on the right. We've got 10 GPM coming in from our heat source. Let's assume the load is on, it's at eight gallons a minute. So the difference between them is two gallons a minute. It goes down through the tank, okay? Combines with the eight coming back from the load and we get our 10 back to the heat source. Now in a four pipe, we also have two GPM going down, but look at how much is entering up here. We've got a much higher entering flow velocity at the top of that tank. And the good side of this is, if that's warm, it's buoyant, it's less uh, dense water, it's going to tend to stay up at the top, but with 10 gallons a minute coming in, you are going to get some mixing in the top of that tank. And likewise, you're going to get some mixing down here. And inevitably, there will be less stratification in that four pipe buffer due to that higher entering flow velocity at this point and at this point compared to the two pipe. Okay, and that's going to tend to break up that stratification. Okay, here's another way to look at it. Uh, with a four pipe buffer, all our energy, whether it's from a biomass boiler, or whatever it is, it really doesn't matter what's creating this heat, it's got to go through thermal storage to make it over to the load. Okay, with a, with a two pipe, 
we have options depending on flows. Some of our energy, uh, for example, if we just turn on the heat source and we don't have a load, it's all going to go to the thermal storage tank. And this is actually how pellet boiler systems are supposed to operate. They, the, the pellet boiler turns on and off simply based on the storage tank temperature. It has no idea what's going on as far as a load, all right? Um, if the heating load is on at the same time as the heat source, some of our energy can go that way. If the heat source is off, but the load is on, we can pull heat out of thermal storage and we can send it up to the load. So we have more versatility with a two pipe buffer, okay? Now, getting it right with the two pipe, all right? I mentioned uh, one of our uh, potential flaws with a two pipe system is warm water coming back from the load going through a heat source that's off. Well, you can stop that. One of the nice ways to stop that is with a differential pressure valve that's set for roughly one PSI. Now you might be thinking, why not just use a spring-loaded check valve? And I will tell you, a spring-loaded check valve can work just fine if you can find one that has a spring that would give it a forward opening pressure of about one, maybe one and a half PSI. Most of the spring checks that are on the market right now have a spring that opens at between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 PSI. It's not quite enough to stop that. And we've, we've monitored these systems and we've seen this. Um, so if you can swap out the cartridge in that check valve and take it from a, a 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 PSI up to maybe one or 1 1.5 PSI, uh, it can work. A differential pressure bypass valve is essentially the same thing. You, you can adjust the, the pressure. And if you screw the knob all the way out, and I've actually looked at three different manufacturers products on this, and they're all pretty similar. If you screw the knob all the way out, the forward opening pressure is in this range of one to 1.5 PSI. And that can uh, provide enough forward opening resistance. So when this pump down here, the heat source pump is off, we're not going to have flow going back through it, okay? The other thing you could do is put a motorized ball valve in here and tie that in probably with your circulator so that when you get a, when you, you want the heat source to operate, the first thing that would happen is the motorized ball valve would open and you can use an end switch in that actuator of that motorized ball valve to enable the circulator to operate. Or you could just wire them in parallel. I, I kind of like the end switch because if for any reason that motorized ball valve doesn't open, if there's a failure of some sort, it doesn't energize the uh, circulator, okay? So here's an example of that on a two pipe system. Uh, it could be a Belimo. Uh, there's several manufacturers that have motorized ball valves. And this can be a spring return actuator, very simple. It could be line voltage. So whenever the pump energizes, the valve opens. And then once the pump de-energizes, the spring action in the actuator will uh, close that valve up. And here's essentially the same schematic, just using the differential pressure valve. Uh, the differential pressure valve would be less expensive and it's, it's a passive device. It doesn't require any electricity. And I plotted out a curve here or a line for what the diff forward differential pressure through that valve is as a function of flow rate. And you can see it opens right around one PSI and then as the flow rate goes up, the pressure drop through the valve goes up, but not very much. Uh, that inch and a quarter valve would have to be at 15 GPM to get up around, looks like about 1.8 uh, PSI. And you can size a circulator to handle that without a problem, okay? So those are a couple ways to prevent this uh, inadvertent or what many people refer to as ghost flow going through that uh, heat source when it's off. Now, the other thing that's important to keep the mass of that two pipe buffer engaged, you see what we're doing is we're controlling the heat source based on the tank temperature. I'm showing a sensor here in the midpoint of the tank. This could be a simple set point controller with an on and off, you know, in some differential. It could be an outdoor reset controller. If it's a heat pump, it makes sense to not overheat this tank for whatever 
load condition you have. If you have a mild day and you have, let's say, floor heating and you only need 85, 90 degree water, why run the heat pump up to 120 and take the penalty in the coefficient of performance when you can heat the building at 85 degrees? Some of the pellet systems actually use two temperature sensors. They turn on the heat source based on an upper sensor and then they turn off the heat source based on a lower temperature sensor. But the key concept here is we're controlling the heat source based on the tank temperature, not what's going on with the heat emitters and the, the room thermostats, okay? Um, again, hydraulic separation with a two pipe buffer, keep the headers short, generously sized. Uh, many of the 119 gallon tanks like the, the Flexcon tank has a two inch, actually it's a two inch stainless steel pipe nipple coming out of the top here. So you can put in a, a two inch T, put it right next to the tank, it's ideal. Uh, even if you're using bushings to drop down to you know, one inch pipe going to your load or maybe one quarter pipe going back to your heat source, keep that header short and as, as large as possible. And again, why are we doing this? We're trying to use this tank as a good hydraulic separating device between the heat source circulator and the load circulator. Okay. Now, if there's a four pipe configuration and there's a two pipe configuration, what do you get when you average them? And if you average four and two, you get three. So here's a three pipe buffer. And this is actually one of my favorites. Uh, it has the advantage that you can still go direct to load from your heat source. If your load is on and your heat source is on at the same time, we have the same detail up here on the supply side as we had with the two pipe buffer. So we can go directly to the load and also um, the flow that goes through the tank down here now, we have the load coming back and instead of coming down here, it goes into the bottom of the tank. I, I really like this buffer configuration for a heat pump. If you're doing a geothermal heat pump, uh, water to water, or you're doing an air to water heat pump, this is, this is a really good uh, configuration for the tank because what this does is it ensures that you're always engage the thermal mass okay you always uh, anytime that load is on or the heat source is on there's going to be flow going through that tank so if you're going to control the heat source based on room thermostats rather than tank temperature uh, don't don't do a two pipe do a three pipe buffer we can still get good hydraulic separation with this Okay, and uh, again, the flow that goes through the tank is going to be the difference between the heat source flow rate and at least up here, it's going to be um, in the upper portion of that tank, we're going to have lower flow velocities. Um, again, keep those headers, I, I use the term short and fat. We want those headers and where those T's are here and down here, actually this, this um, um, yeah, keep those headers as close to the tank as possible. Here's a couple example systems. Uh, the one on the left is using a boiler. All right, so we can set up a ModCon boiler and we can go into a three pot bu buffer as it's shown. Uh, we've got an air separator. I'm, I'm showing it on a vertical line just to show you there's options. And we're going up to a nice array here of panel rads, maybe some floor heating circuits and a towel warmer. Uh, we're using home run circuits with either half inch packs, half inch tubing of any sort, and we've got a manifold. And to what really caps this off as a nice complement is a variable speed pressure regulated circulator. So that circulator could be set for constant differential pressure, and it'll simply uh, ramp up and down as these thermostatic valves open and close. We we actually talked about this kind of a distribution system uh, on our first uh, installment of uh, these webinars. Um, and it, it's a simple system, it works really well. Uh, this is the exact same distribution system just tied into an air to water heat pump, okay? You do see I'm, I'm showing a check valve in both of these. The reason that check valve is there is when the heat source is off and the tank is warm, what we don't wanna have happen is warm water migrating over here, cooling off and becoming denser. When, when water cools down, it becomes denser. 
and it will sink and it'll flow backwards through the heat source and just dump some of the heat that's in the thermal storage tank into the heat source. And you know, it doesn't harm anything, but it's wasting energy. It's wasting energy that you put into that buffer tank. So you need some method and a spring check is, is really a very simple way to do that um, as opposed to um, a motorized valve. A, a motorized valve could work, but it's, it's definitely more expensive uh, and potentially more prone to, to problems over years of service compared to a simple spring-loaded check valve. Okay, so here is the, a similar idea. We've got three pipe buffers. Actually, I misspoke. This is a four pipe buffer. This could be, for example, the Argosy tank where we're feeding with a heat pump. We're pulling the cool water out of the bottom. Uh, we're going into our heat pump. I, I like to always have a dirt separator of some sort in there. And today with a high efficiency permanent magnet rotors and circulators, I like a magnetic dirt separator. And there's several of those on the market. OK, uh, what that's going to do is clean up that flow if there's any uh, dirt in it or magnetic particles before they go inside the heat pump. And then we're putting that heat back into the tank. And uh, the Argosy tank does have a nice inch and a quarter takeoff up on the top. So we're pulling the, the hottest water directly off the top of that tank. This is the hottest water in the tank. Showing another separator here, air and dirt separator. And we've got a couple pathways. We've got a variable speed pressure regulated circulator going off to some zone valves. Uh, again, this could be going off to other valve based zoning like thermostatic radiator valves. And then the other load is what we talked about last week. That would be the on demand domestic water system where uh, when you draw hot water from a fixture, a flow switch would turn on a circulator. And that's going to take the hot water from the top of the tank, push it down through the primary side of the heat exchanger. As cold domestic water goes up the other side of that heat exchanger. And I'm showing here a tankless electric water heater as a boost. Um, if it's a heat pump, we're probably not going to get this tank up hot enough to provide 100% of our domestic water. Possible, but we're going to take a performance penalty to do that. If it were a boiler, instead of a heat pump, you could easily uh, get keep this tank at a temperature that's high enough to provide 100% of your domestic water through this heat exchanger, and you could eliminate the electric tankless. Now, over here on the right, same basic idea. The only thing that's changed, I'm using a tank type electric uh, water heater as our final temperature boost. Again, assuming we have a heat pump over here, we might only be maintaining the buffer based on outdoor reset control. So we're going to need, uh, we're only gonna get a preheating effect through our stainless steel heat exchanger. We're gonna need something to top it off. So either of these is an option with a heat pump. If it were a ModCon boiler, uh, you could probably eliminate this or eliminate the electric tank and s simply make sure the buffer tank is warm enough to provide 100% of your domestic hot water. So kind of a summary here, uh, we've talked about four pipe, two pipe, and three pipe. So this is just kind of a comparison um, with the four pipe. We still have the check valve here. Uh, with the two pipe, I'm showing the differential pressure valve set for one to 1.5 PSI. And actually with the three pipe, you can get rid of this. Still put the check valve in there so you don't get reverse thermosiphoning when the tank is warm and the heat source is off but you don't have to have that um, provision that you do with a two pipe tank. So again, I, I tend to like the three pipe tank for that reason, okay. a little simpler. So we've talked a, a lot about these two pipe tanks. Uh, we're gonna go to our second poll question, Mike. And um, have, you ever, have you as an installer ever used a two pipe buffer tank? Yeah, our last poll was not successful. This one will go a little bit better here. So, uh, have we ever set up a two pipe buffer tank? Yes, no. What is that? <laughs> now, we have an expectation for the answers on this, but we're going to uh, listen to what the audience has to say as well. 
Yeah, John, our last poll did not close properly. So you had about three or four slides of people uh, waiting for uh, that screen to close. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you to everybody who messaged me. <laughs> So the results are uh, no uh, is the winner in this one at 77%. Yes is at 20%. And uh, 3% is at what is that? <laughs> hey, I'm surprised. Um, I actually thought that the vast majority would be no on this or number three. Uh, I'm um actually encouraged to hear that there are some folks out there that have looked at a two-pipe buffer and uh, you know seen some of the advantages and again we the reason I said we had expectations that this would be largely no is that a two-pipe buffer is is relatively new it's a new concept in North American hydronics um, so uh, you know good opportunity to see it this morning okay so let's close out that poll Mike and I'm going to go on to our next slide over here so uh, I just want to show you, we started off with a system like uh, similar to this, where we did not have a buffer tank and we calculated that with a short or a small load on, our boiler was only going to run 42 seconds. So I'm just modifying that system now and showing it with a two pipe buffer, okay? So uh, again, we could use the formula we talked about earlier to size that buffer tank up, um, showing a, uh, very, this could be a variable speed circulator now that we have valve-based zoning going on. And the next slide I want to show you too is the same system, but with a four-pipe. Either one of these can work. Uh, remember, with the two-pipe, we want to turn, let me go back up here. I don't show it here, but you should be turning this heat source on and off based on the tank temperature, not the room thermostats up here. And we would still give priority to operation of the uh, domestic water indirect tank. Okay, now I wanna show you a concept that is uh, used by quite a few manufacturers in Europe and it's, it's what I call a single thermal mass combi system, okay? Now this is not it. This, uh, you'll see there's two tanks in this schematic. We've got an indirect tank over here on the left for domestic water and I'm showing a ModCon boiler and a buffer tank. Uh, I'm showing a relatively small buffer tank, maybe it's a 30 gallon tank, all right? Um, but the, the key thing here is there's two tanks. There's this tank for buffering a, a highly zoned distribution system, and then there's a, a separate tank strictly for domestic hot water. And of course, this boiler would uh, likely go to a higher temperature and on a priority call for domestic hot water, it would turn on this circulator. And once the tank is satisfied, uh, it would go back to looking at the temperature in the buffer tank and operating as necessary to keep this buffer tank either at a set point or outdoor reset control. This can work, but there's two tanks. And obviously that two tanks are gonna cost more than a single tank, right? So we have increased cost. We have more standby loss because we have more surface area from the two tanks. And we certainly take up more space in a mechanical room with two tanks. So what about this idea? And I've, I've put together, in essence, what you'll find in the European market. Uh, we've got a modulating condensing burner assembly. So think of this as the core of a boiler. The, uh, you know, effectively, it is the, the boiler minus, uh, it's the boiler in a different jacket. It's the boiler in a different cabinet. And what that is doing is it's maintaining water temperature in this tank that's actually at the bottom of this cabinet. And this tank might be 25 or 30 gallons of water. It's not a huge tank. And it's maintaining it hot enough. Uh, and there's also a stainless steel coil inside that tank. So when cold domestic water comes in, it goes through the coil. And on a single pass, it comes out, goes through an anti-scald valve, and it goes right out to the load. So the mass in this tank, the water mass in this tank is providing 100% of the domestic water heating. So it's, it's at a temperature that can fully heat the domestic water on a single pass. And it's acting as a buffer 
four. What I'm showing here is a home run distribution system with panel radiators, uh, where each panel radiator has a thermostatic radiator valve on it. So it's a simple idea, this little orange thing here, this is an expansion tank that they build in. And I just wanna show you some examples, okay? These are companies, some of you recognize some of these companies. Uh, ACV is now under the name um, Group Atlantic, but if at a trade show, oftentimes they have these things cut away or opened up. You can see the tank down here with the coil in it. You can see the tank right here. Uh, this is actually a burner assembly at the top, and then the, the whole tank down below it here has actually multiple coils in it. So these products do exist in the European market. Um, I'm not aware at this point of these types of products where we have a single tank buffering space heating loads as well as providing domestic water. Uh, I'm not aware of any in North America at this point. Now, I'm I could be wrong, but I would love to see more products because I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, the European market, uh, they drive towards what I call an appliance as opposed to a boiler and a domestic water tank. They combine that functionality into a single device. And sometimes you'll actually find these devices, you'll see the, the external appearance of these is pretty clean. You'll find these mounted right in a kitchen. They, they simply don't have the space in many of the apartments and condominiums to have them a separate mechanical room. So these are actually designed to be, actually, they look pretty nice. Uh, in fact, I would say if you took away the, um, the, the glass windows here and you put a handle on this thing and asked the average North American what it is, they'd probably tell you it's a refrigerator freezer. Okay, it's, it's actually not quite as big as a refrigerator freezer, but a uh, very clean industrial design there. So I just wanna show you that concept. So here's kind of a comparison between, you know, the North American approach of two separate tanks versus the European approach of a single thermal mass. So the difference is, again, we eliminate the domestic water tank circulator. Uh, it's pre-assembled versus on-site. So uh, you're saving in terms of on-site labor there. And we have a single thermal mass that is buffering both our space heating load and our domestic water load. Okay, I like the concept. I think I'd love to see more products in the North American market that use this. Uh, here's an example of a single thermal mass that is doing domestic water and space heating. Uh, in this case, it is supplied by a pellet boiler, but you could use a similar system to do a, a heat pump or you know or just a, a standard gas boiler uh, so uh the pellet boiler is the primary heat source here and it's operating based on these two temperature sensors to try to keep this tank warm and uh, i haven't put specific numbers but let's say we keep the tank no cooler than maybe 120 degrees all right so we've got our sidearm assembly that we talked about last week for doing domestic water with that external brace plate heat exchanger and the flow switch and the circulator. And then at the top of the tank, we've piped in a ModCon boiler, okay? And I want you to take note that that ModCon boiler is only piped across the upper portion of this tank. Uh, the, the size of a thermal storage tank with a biomass boiler is it's fairly large. Uh, a good rule of thumb is two gallons of water storage in the tank per thousand BTUs per hour of pellet boiler capacity. So 100,000 BTU per hour pellet boiler, you're looking at a 200 gallon tank. And we don't wanna heat that entire tank up with that ModCon boiler. We don't need to. We just need to heat up enough water so we don't short cycle the ModCon boiler. Um, so our configuration over here is we've got a two pipe, um, Actually, we're using injection mixing here with a variable speed circulator. So you could have a little Tecmar 356 control or an HBX control running uh, the circulator. And that's injecting to a pair of closely spaced T's. And then we have our zoned distribution system. We have a variable speed pump and we're picking up our supply temperature here downstream of the circulator. And that's providing feedback to our mixing controller over here. And I'm showing an outdoor sensor. So we, we could use outdoor reset control to operate this boiler. And that boiler has a external sensor uh, in the upper portion of that tank. So again, it's 
there, there are many potential variations on this, but it shows the concept of a single thermal tank that is buffering space heating and providing domestic hot water. Now, oftentimes what will happen is, uh, especially with larger biomass boilers, and this could happen with a large building with a, a big load, you, you need more thermal storage than what one tank can provide. Okay, so I did a comparison here. I said, look, maybe it's a solar thermal system. Uh, maybe it's a, a pellet boiler system. Uh, let's say we're looking for around 500 gallons of thermal storage, all right? We could do that with 419 gallon tanks. And maybe maybe it's a situation where we can't get a large tank into the building or into the space where the storage has to go. So we're going to go with these smaller tanks. Well, that's okay, and I'm going to show you how to pipe that. But um, it's very important that you understand that there is a much higher ratio of surface area to volume when you go with multiple smaller tanks versus a single larger tank. And why is that important? Surface area to volume ratio. Well, the more surface area you have, the more heat loss you're going to have. And essentially, if the water temperatures are the same in both scenarios here, uh, and we have 50% more surface area with the smaller tanks, we're going to have 50% more standby loss. So, uh, you know, I did some simple calculations here, assuming we had flat ended cylinders for the tanks, and we came up with a four smaller tanks versus a single 476 gallon tank. And I used a height to diameter ratio of three for all these tanks. All right, it's a typical height to diameter ratio. Um, we'd actually end up 59% more surface area with the four small tanks. Now, again, I'm not saying don't do the four small tanks. You may have other constraints that simply don't allow this size tank to be present. And if you are working with a big tank like this, first of all, it's probably going to be an ASME certified tank based on codes. I know in New York State, anything over 119 gallons has to have an ASME certification. And it's likely going to be a steel welded steel tank. Uh, look at the logistics. How are you going to get that to the site? How are you going to get it in the building? How are you going to insulate it? Uh, there's a lot more questions with that type of tank compared to buying a pre-insulated 119 gallon tank. So, you know, there's scenarios for both of these, but realize that the uh, heat loss is going to be greater with the multiple smaller tanks. Okay. Now, how do you pipe it? Well, there's several ways and uh, we're kind of getting near the end here. You could do reverse return piping like this. This is putting all three tanks in parallel and it's also setting up valving and unions with the potential to disconnect any of these tanks and the potential to remove any of these tanks without shutting down the other tanks. Now I say that, imagine these three tanks are parked up against a wall and you put this piping in in front of the tanks just the way it's shown. The question is, how are you going to get that middle tank out of there if it has to come out for any reason? It's easy to shut the ball valves off and open the unions, but how are you going to get it around that piping? So think about these things. If you're going to do something like this, this piping really needs to be up overhead so that you can physically remove one of those tanks. Now, Again, that's a design decision you have to make. Uh, my thoughts, uh, especially with ASME certified tanks, in a closed system, properly maintained with low oxygen levels, these tanks should last for decades, many decades. So the likelihood of having to remove a tank is pretty small, but that's a decision you have to make. If you want to be you know, the ultimate in terms of flexibility to remove a tank, Make sure the piping allows it. And the other thing you'll see here, there's a lot of piping and a lot of hardware, and that's going to add up costs significantly compared to a single large tank. Now, here's a, I showed you a slide earlier of three 600 gallon ASME tanks tied in with a uh, half a million BTU per hour pellet boiler. Well, there's, there's how they did it. Not a pretty picture in my, 
imagine you have to take that tank in the back out of there. It's it's going to be a major, major cut project. There's just no way that tank is coming out of there without basically taking just about all of that piping out. So this was not a well thought out system. Uh, it is in, it functions, but um, it, it certainly doesn't address the potential to have to remove one of those tanks. Here's a little bit simpler piping. This is direct return. It, it takes away the reverse return aspect. If you do this, make sure that you have a balancing valve on each tank. Um, an example is that Kalefi uh, quick setter valve. It has a little flow meter built into it. So you could turn on the pumps over here, probably on your heat source, and you could just go through with a screwdriver and adjust these valves so you're getting approximately, it doesn't have to be exact, but approximately the same flow going through the tanks. And then I would go over here, turn on your load circulators and do the same thing, adjust your uh, flow rates for, for balance. Um, and it, the nice thing about this valve is uh, not only can you use it for balancing, if you did have to isolate a tank, you could sh completely shut off the flow with it. Uh, same argument applies with the piping. If your intent is to be able to remove this tank from service, any of these tanks without shutting down a system, um, you have to make sure that piping is out of the way. Now, I want to show you one other piping method for multiple tanks. And I, I'm showing this for two tanks, but this could apply to more than two tanks. This is actually a combination of two tanks that are close coupled with a fitting that I happen to come across. It's made by a company called Metroflex. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with what's called a Fernco fitting. Well, first thing I want to tell you, this is not a fern co fitting. Fern co fittings are for drainage, waste, and ventilation piping. They aren't really rated for temperature and not much pressure. Uh, this is a reinforced high temperature uh, coupling that has high quality stainless steel clamps on it, and it's reinforced with stainless steel rings both inside and outside. And it's actually rated up to 225 degree service temperature at 75 PSI. They make this available from two inch up to 12 inch pipe sizes. And this would be a simple way to connect two tanks side by side. Um, basically what you're doing is just putting a short length of pipe in here that I'm assuming threads into the connection on the side of the tank. And then you're spanning that um, coupling across those two pieces of pipe. This is going to also give you uh, the ability to handle a slight amount of misalignment between those two tanks. Uh, in a perfect world, those tanks would sit on a perfectly flat floor. And when the tanks were built at the factory, their, their, um, the orientation of the piping coming out would be exactly the same. So they should just slide right next to each other and no problem. We don't live in a perfect world. So we've got slight misalignment due to a floor that's slightly out of flat or a tank that um, if the uh, weldment in that tank or however that pipe comes out of that tank is slightly off, we want the ability to have slight amount of compensation. And when I say slight, maybe an eighth of an inch. You're, you're not gonna be able to take a quarter inch or half an inch of misalignment with a coupling like this. So what that does is it, it closely couples those two tanks. And if you look at that overall configuration up here in the upper right, this is essentially a two pipe configuration with two tanks. We're taking our load circulator off or our, our load pipe goes off upstream so we can go direct to load with the heat. And we're bringing our pipe back here and we've got our uh, flow coming back through here. I am showing a check valve. Uh, and I'm also showing a check valve up here in this circulator, and that's just again we don't want we don't want flow to reverse thermosiphon between the tanks and the heat source when uh, the heat source is off. So it's a nice uh, option. We have used this kind of a uh, design detail before, closely coupling the tanks. Uh, it certainly reduces down the amount of piping. The one thing it doesn't provide, and this is not in my opinion, not a highly necessary option. Uh, you can't take one tank out of this picture and keep the other tank running without having to reconfigure some piping. So we don't have ball valves shutting off tanks and 
and the ability to take it apart. But again, high quality tanks, closed loop system, good maintenance of the system, uh, very minimal chance that you'll have to do that. Okay. Now, uh, next week is the wrap up and it's on the future of hydronic heating and cooling. Uh, we're gonna go 90 minutes next week. We've got a lot to talk about. We're gonna have a guest. Uh, I guess I'll leave it as a surprise who the guest is gonna be, but uh, he's well respected in the industry and I think he'll have some interesting ideas to contribute. And uh, with that, I'm gonna pause here and Mike, do we have some questions we can address? Yeah, so uh, we've got uh, a couple of good buffer tank questions. Uh, the first one comes from Steve. Uh, just pointing out if buffer tanks are so critical to proper system design and install uh, on condensing boilers, why are people not using the heating appliance uh, as part of that buffer? Uh, why are people not I using the heating? I think where he's going with that is if you had a project with a wall hung condensing boiler, say a small house, and you had radiant floor on it with no actuators on it, you could use that floor as part of your buffer uh, in the system. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you've got you know essentially one zone with a high mass emitter, like like a slab type floor heating, um, I would still suggest a hydraulic separator between the boiler and that load. But definitely, you do not need a buffer tank. Uh, you've got plenty of buffering in the slab. Now let me let me quickly change that. Let and Mike, you mentioned no actuators. Let's say we had exactly the same building, and we've got maybe half a dozen different circuits out there in that floor slab, and we put actuators and thermostats in. So all of a sudden now we're we're adding a lot of um, diversity. We're adding a lot of smaller zones in there. Now I would go back to a buffer tank, even though we've got a slab it's it's the number of independently operating zones that you have to be concerned about and always picture your system where you turn on just the smallest zone and ask yourself the question is the system stable under that condition if the smallest zone is maybe 20 percent of your boiler capacity and you've got a 10 to 1 turn down you could make the argument you could still get away without a buffer tank so obviously the the greater the turndown ratio of the heat source um, and the larger the the smallest zone requirement is uh, the less need of a buffer tank. Yeah, we run into that quite a bit, John, on heat pumps where people will say, can I use the floor? Uh, because a heat pump requires a lot more buffer, it's a little trickier, but with a condensing uh, modulating boiler, it's usually pretty achievable. Yeah, we're starting to see too, some manufacturers are offering, uh, and I think you'll see more of this, water to water heat pumps with inverter compressors. So you're, you're going to see water to water heat pumps eventually move towards modulation as opposed to just an on and off. But if it, yeah, if it's an on and off heat pump and you've got zoning, even with a floor, I, I would still go with a buffer tank. Uh, Terry has a good question. Uh, Terry would like to know what a thermal image uh, shows a temperature profile. The answer is yes, Terry. If you email me after this, I can actually send you a video that Queen's University did showing the proper and improper uh, stratification of a tank using a, a time lapse video. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Do you have anything to add to that one, Joe? Well, we did a. Um... We did a system uh, in New York State with a pellet boiler and it actually had a 210 gallon tank in it. We have five temperature sensors from top to bottom. And uh, I'm actually just waiting for some data right now on that, but we were seeing some really good temperature stratification. So, you know, you could, uh, depending on, you know, what your budget is, if you want to monitor stratification in a tank, uh, it, it's going to be tough to do it with a factory insulated tank because it's going to arrive, you know, with the jacket on it, with whatever um, sensor wells the manufacturer has chosen to use. But when you get one of the tanks, uh, a custom built welded steel tank, I mean, you can have that built any way you want. You could put, you could put a whole array of, of uh, let's say, half inch or three quarter inch FPT tappings, 
and you could put wells in and put temperature sensors in there and and monitor that uh, you know obviously that would be great as a research project i'm not sure how many projects would have the budget to support doing that but yeah and uh, I, I read that question john it's just a general question could he see it i don't think he's trying to actually do it <laughs> yeah you you could um you're going to see some amount if you scan the outer jacket of the tank, uh, obviously not as much as if you were looking right at the pressure vessel itself with a thermal imaging camera. Yeah, um, John's got an awesome question as well. So he's wondering about doing two different uh, buffer tanks on a heat pump so that he could do heating and cooling terminals. And, and John, that's something that we'll do frequently. Um, my only two cents on that is it, it does add significant controls and costs, but we would do that pretty frequently on our equipment and, and john your five cents yeah there's uh when you get into let's say light commercial buildings uh where you've got a potential for simultaneous heating and cooling going on a typical scenario being the perimeter on a fall day e even a winter day sometimes you know the prim perimeters on heating but the core area of the building where there's no exposed surfaces is, is on cooling uh, absolutely, you can set up heat pumps to do, uh, you know, uh, two buffer tanks, a hot tank and a cool tank. The other thing that's really nice, um, you can actually set up a water to water heat pump between the two buffer tanks. And it can get you uh, extremely high COPs because uh, it's benefiting you both at the hot tank and the cold tank. You're, you're simultaneously producing chilled water for the cooling load at the same time you're producing hot water for the heating load. Um, now, in a residential project, uh, maybe a really large custom residential project where the owner is you know, emphatic, I want the ability to do heating and cooling at the same time, uh, yeah, go for it, put in the two buffer tanks. Average residential project, probably not worth it. Um, especially at, when we get into heat pumps that that can modulate uh, any heat pump with an inverter drive compressor, uh, they, they can go down to about 30% of the rated output. So here's the thought, and we actually did talk about this um, a little bit in a previous session. Go to the buffer tank on heating and do whatever you want with zoning. You want 10 zones, 10 panel rads with you know thermostatic valves, you can do it, but take advantage of the inverter compressor and cooling don't go to the buffer tank and cooling just let the heat pump modulate down to maintain a you know a preset leaving water temperature like 45 degrees or 50 degrees fahrenheit and you know you could go to you could potentially take a 4 ton peak rated heat pump and connect it to a 3 ton air handler or even a 2 ton air handler and let the compressor speed modulate down so that you don't short cycle. Just basically control the heat pump based on leaving water temperature. And the new heat pumps, uh, I, I can speak to one in particular with a, uh, a split system air to water heat pump with, with an inverter compressor, it can do that. You can set up the controls so that it could monitor its outlet temperature and you can either set that up for a set point or in, in case of heating, you can set it up for outdoor reset control and uh, let the compressor do the uh, thinking for you. Okay, so George uh, throws a question at me. He's actually saying, Michael, I'd like to use buffer tanks, but we're finding mechanical rooms are too small in most houses. George, we had a job in Toronto we did with a customer where the room is so small, we actually put the room into CAD to figure out how we were gonna fit the, uh, the boiler and the indirect around the electrical panel. Um, yeah. So certainly we're very empathetic to that. Um, the Argosys tank, uh, which the, one of the handouts here where you see the buffer tank application manual that talks about the Argosys tank, they have a new model, the Buff 22, that's only 35 inches high. And because it has side ports, which you saw in the previous slides John was just doing, it's a little bit easier to fit in those uh, tight mechanical rooms. John, do you have something to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, it's those architects. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully there's not too many architects on today. <laughs> yeah, well, architects, if you're on, we, we need we need a mechanical room that has enough space. And, and I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kidding here, but all, 
you know, I, this has been a, a challenge ever since I've been in the industry is, uh, you know, getting a mechanical room, getting a space that is large enough to do this. And obviously that can be a challenge. Uh, yeah, the tanks, uh, that can be a low profile tank. You could actually, you could actually set your heat source above that tank. So use the vertical space in a mechan in a small tight mechanical room, as opposed to just, you know, just the horizontal space you might, depending on what the tank is, if it has upper connections on it, you're probably going to have to build some type of a shelf, but you could do that. You could build a shelf out of uh, lumber or it could be fabricated up out of some channel strut and set your heat source on top of that. It could be a, you know, water to water heat pump, for example, and uh, put the, you know, buffer tank on the, on the floor, put the heat source up above it. Good response. Yeah. Um, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name, but I believe it's Gabor is uh, asking a great question about the Turbomax product. We talked quite a bit about that in the last session, so it's uh, a reverse indirect. And he's asking with the Turbomax indirect water here with the slide toppings, is it a buffer tank? The answer is, is yes. So if you're going to order a Turbomax from us, make sure you specify you want the EXT model. We stock them in all variety of sizes, but the EXT gives you side tapping so that now it's not just your uh, domestic hot water, but it's also your buffer tank. It's a really yeah, strict so, so you could set it up as a four pipe buffer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it's not and, that expensive. It adds about uh, $200 to the cost of, uh, of the TurboMax. So. Yeah, and, and interestingly, the, the standard TurboMax can still be set up as a buffer tank uh, as a two pipe configuration. Yes. Okay, because yeah, as a two pipe, it can't be set up as a, if you want the four pipe, as Mike's saying, uh, get, you know, order the one that has the extra connections. But if you're, if you are going to set up a standard TurboMax tank as a buffer, as a two pipe configuration, it, it, you know, you can do it that way without the extra connections. Uh, Clements asked the question, John, I'll leave this one for you. Where is a three pipe buffer not appropriate? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, really could use it just about everywhere. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any situation where, I, I guess I would lean, if you're going to be controlling your heat source with your zone thermostats, I'd probably still lean back towards a four pipe buffer uh, because of, um, uh, yeah, I, I, you don't want to create a situation. I guess I'll answer the question with another question or uh, observation. Uh, always look at the system and say, is there any operating mode where the flow through the buffer tank is, is actually either zero or very low? Could the heat source be satisfied and not heat the buffer tank up? And you know, with a two pipe buffer, that's entirely possible if you control the heat source from your zone thermostats. So again, I wanted to emphasize with a two pipe, you absolutely need to control the heat source from the tank temperature. And I would, I would tend to lean that way for a three pipe as well. Okay, anytime you're, you have the potential to go directly from your heat source to your load, uh, which you do on a three pipe tank, um, you need to control the heat source based on the tank temperature, not the zone thermostat. So to get back to his question, if if you were going to go with a scenario um, of controlling your heat source from your room thermostats, I'd probably lean back towards the four pipe buffer. All right, so follow up question, John, in a minute or less, what is the advantage of a three pipe over a two pipe? The advantage of the three pipe is that you're always going to have some flow coming back into the bottom of the tank. You're, you're, you're not going to inadvertently create a scenario where you don't have any significant flow going through the tank. Um, I like the three pipe buffer with a heat pump in particular. Uh, it re it's really nice to have the direct to load capability at the supply side of the buffer, but you're always ensured that your thermal mass in your tank is getting the coolest water coming back from the load. And, and by the way, that also ensures that your heat pump is operating with the coolest water coming back from the lower portion of the buffer tank. Uh, you're, you're not getting as much mixing. One of the things that has happened with four pipe buffers and heat pumps, 
heat pumps have a relatively high flow rate per thousand BTUs of capacity. A you know, rule of thumb is about three GPM per ton of heat pump. So we got a four ton heat pump and let's say an 80 gallon buffer tank, we've got um, 12 gallons a minute coming into that buffer tank. And that tends to mix the tank up pretty good. And what'll happen is some of the warm water from the top of the tank will actually get mixed down into the lower portion of the tank. And of course, what that does is it raises the water temperature going back to the evaporator of the heat pump. So the heat pump is actually feeling warmer water coming in and that is going to that's going to have an effect on cop it's going to it's going to lower the cop so uh i like the the three pipe buffer with either a water to water heat pump or a um, air to water heat pump i think it's it's an ideal combination of a lot of features and it, it also eliminates the need for that differential uh pressure valve that is a requirement with a two pipe buffer and you just indirectly answered the next question. So well done, John. <laughs> Should we go on to uh, fix, find a fix? One more question, and then we'll go to find the fix. Uh, this okay. one comes up a lot, so it's worth discussing flow checks versus spring check valves. Uh, I like spring checks. Um, the flow checks are kind of an older technology. They work. Uh, and, and I'm assuming by that, uh, the the uh, person asking the question is thinking about a cast iron valve that has a weighted plug in it that would open up when the circulator comes on. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, I tend to like the spring check valves a little better than a flow check valve. Uh, they're less expensive. They're either stainless or brass versus cast iron. You don't have to put the plug in the port that it's not used. Um, one of the things I'd love to see more uh, availability on in the industry is a spring check valve where you have an option for the spring check cartridge that goes into the valve. In other words, imagine a standard, you know, brass body or stainless steel body. Think of that as a shell that goes into the piping and the actual check valve mechanism is uh, usually it's a thermoplastic assembly uh, one company, uh, Neo Pearl, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of that company, Neo Pearl. Uh, they build all different types of spring check assemblies and they, they can change the springs and they could give you a cartridge that would open at 1.2 or 2.0, whatever you want. So if you have the shell that's in the piping and you simply could change the cartridge and it's just a matter of pushing out the cartridge or perhaps even buying the check valve without the cartridge installed and either ordering it with a specific cartridge or maybe the manufacturer puts two cartridges in the box. One is a standard cartridge at 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 PSI. The other is a little bit higher, maybe 1.5 PSI. And you simply select which one you want. That would be really nice in the case of a two pipe buffer. I'd go with the higher, uh, spring tension, and that would that would probably be a less expensive solution than the differential uh, pressure valve. So yeah, I, I tend to like the spring checks better. Okay, Mike, should we go on to find a fix? Actually, John, as we've been uh, chatting here, two really good questions just came in. That if we can address them quickly, I think it'd be worthwhile. The first okay. one, uh, like the one you just answered, comes up a lot. Uh, Michelle is asking, most circulators, I just want to add the word in most residential circulators, come with an integrated check valve. Would you still install a separate check valve uh, in your buffer tank configuration? If it's a two pipe buffer, uh, what we have found is that the spring check that is factory supplied with the circulators just isn't quite strong enough. And that's critically dependent on how close those T's are to the tank. If if you bring those T's that go off to your load, if you bring those a few feet away from that tank, you're adding resistance in that common piping circuit. And it's not hard to get up over like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 PSI, uh, in which case those spring checks that are in the circulators, uh, they'll open. Now, uh, if you're going with a two pipe buffer, I would prefer to see the 
differential bypass valve or a spring check that has a stronger spring in it. Or as I showed, you could go with a motorized ball valve as well. Um, so it's a good question. And originally we thought that the spring check that was built into the circulator would be enough, but field experience has shown that we're getting we're getting migration through there when that circulator is off with a two pipe buffer. So that's why we go to the uh, you know the higher spring tension or uh, the differential pressure valve or the motorized ball valve. Okay, one more question, then we move on, John. So uh, Patrick has asked the question, I have a boiler with a four pipe hydraulic separator. In looking at the boiler runtime and the cycles, he's wondering if it would be better to run the tank on outdoor reset uh, rather than thermostats calling the boiler. Uh, now, he said he has a boiler with a hydraulic separator. Did he mean a buffer tank as the hydraulic? Say, I would say yes, because of the reference to the tank later on. So if you have a boiler, okay. Into a four pipe tank or a buffer tank, yeah. would you run an outdoor reset okay. or from the thermostats? Well, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll put a caveat on there. If you can do outdoor reset with a variable differential, and I know the Techmark controls have that built into it, uh, what will happen with outdoor reset if you have a fixed differential between your, you know, context, closed context, open? Let's say it's a 10 degree differential. Obviously, as you get to partial load, uh, your building doesn't need as much heat. So it's going to tend to drive you towards shorter cycles, uh, even though the actual temperature differential between on and off isn't changing. Uh, the Tecmar, uh, I believe it is the 256 controller, and this may be available in other controllers as well. Uh, they have a, a, a wider, they have the option to go to a wider differential. So as the outdoor temperature increases, the differential between heat source on and heat source off increases. Now the trade-off here, you get longer boiler cycles because the differential is increasing, but the trade-off is you're also, your water temperature variation is getting wider and wider as you go to part load conditions. The average water temperature is gonna stay the same so you should have, over a period of time, you should have the same amount of heat delivery to your load based on average water temperature, but the, wi the widening, the automatic widening of that temperature differential, uh, and I, I believe that's why Techmar incorporated that as an option into their controller, is to help uh, get away from short cycling uh, as you get to partial load conditions. So yes, if they use a, the buffer tank and they set it up for outdoor reset, I would set it up, I believe Tegmar calls it auto differential. I think that's the feature. Uh, and as I say, there may be other controllers that can do that. And certainly if you're working with a building automation system or some type of programmable control, uh, look into a variable differential. And in that case, uh, I think outdoor reset would, would be fine with the buffer tank. Okay, Mike, okay, I'm gonna go to on. To, yeah, let's move on to, uh, again, we wanna uh, thank the sponsors, uh, IBC Intergas, Ray Howe, uh, Water Furnace, uh, Velo and Flexcon and Kalefi. Thank you for supporting this. Um, also, Mike tells me this morning that Eden Energy Equipment is hiring. So if you're interested in working for Eden Energy, there's an email address there. Uh, send an email in and uh, I'll leave it at that. Let them discuss uh, uh, a potential employment. Now, one of the things we've been doing is uh, what we call find the fix. So at the end of these, uh, where I'm gonna show you some scenarios here. And I, I've drawn a few just from primary secondary piping. Uh, there's still a lot of it being used and there's still questions on it. So here's our first situation. We've got a primary loop down here at the bottom, closely spaced T's, and this piping here just represents some type of a secondary circuit going to a radiator or whatever. And you'll notice the secondary circulator is, uh, I'll say it's pumping out of the secondary and into the primary. That's the error, okay? The problem here is the expansion tank is going to be tapped into the primary loop. 
So from a secondary loop standpoint, it sees the primary loop as the expansion tank, okay? That's the pressure reference point. And we always wanna pump away from the pressure reference point. So the fix on this, okay, is, let me jump right to it. Oh, before I leave this, uh, you're, you're gonna end up sucking the water through the secondary circuit versus pushing the water through the secondary circuit. And depending on the static pressure and the elevation of that secondary circuit, it's conceivable you could pull the pressure down to or slightly below atmospheric pressure. And if you've got an air vent or a valve packing that's a little loose, uh, and you go below atmospheric pressure at any point in the system, you're gonna suck air into the system doing that. So that's the potential problem with this. Now the fix is simply put the circulator so it pumps into the secondary circuit, all right? Now uh, with the primary loop being your pressure reference point, the differential pressure produced by the circulator is going to be added to the static pressure in the secondary loop and you're going to bring the pressure up and much less chance of causing uh, an air leak into the system or uh, cavitating the circulator. If you're dealing with high temperature water and a high head uh, secondary circulator uh, and low static pressure, I mean, that's kind of the perfect storm combination to get you into cavitation in the circulator. This is going to help by elevating the pressure uh, at the inlet of the circulator. So always remember, pump into your secondary circuits, okay? Now, another common error with secondary circuits is lack of thermal siphon protection. In theory, we would have you know, zero pressure drop between these T's, and we'd like to think that the hot water coming from our heat source would just zip right through here and keep on going when that circuit is off. Well, remember, hot water is much more buoyant. It's, it's lower density than cold water. So hot water wants to go up, just like a hot air balloon wants to go up. And if we give it a pathway, hot water will migrate up here. And of course, as it does, we have cooler water over on the return side of the secondary. That water is heavier. It's cooler, it's more dense, it's heavier. So we have light water here, we have heavy water over here, we're going to have a sustained thermosiphon action in that secondary circuit, even with the circulator off, okay? And uh, granted, it will be small initially, it'll be a fairly weak phenomenon, but once we turn on that secondary circulator and we kind of prime our secondary loop with temperature, when we go to turn off the secondary circulator, we're leaving it in a, I'll call it a thermally primed condition. We've got hot water going up, cool water coming back. It's going to try to perpetuate that as long as there's hot water flowing in the primary loop. We've made this mistake years ago and uh, scratched our heads and finally figured it out. Hot water wants to go up, cold water wants to go down. How do you fix it? Okay, the way you fix it is you put in a check valve or a flow check. So you could use a circulator with a built-in check valve. That should take care of it. Uh, that's assuming that these T's are right next to each other. If we start to build up differential pressure, if you put a foot or two of pipe between these T's or you put a valve in between these T's for purging, I don't like that detail. Now we're getting pressure drop here. And that, if that pressure drop is more than let's say three tenths of a PSI, this little check valve may not hold it back, okay? And again, that would make a case for keeping these T's close together and possibly going with a, um, a check valve that has a, a stronger spring in it, like a one PSI. So basically either a spring-loaded check valve or a, a weighted plug flow check, make sure all your secondary circuits have that as a means to prevent this thermal siphoning, okay? And then that leads me up, my, my last one again, uh, this is a detail that some people have done in the past, um, there may be some people doing it still, and it's well-intentioned, and the intent is let's put a ball valve in between these T's, uh, 
and we'll close the ball valve during purging, which will force all our primary flow up through the secondary circuit, pushing our air ahead of it out here and, and so forth. And then once we have that air out of the system, we're just gonna open up the ball valve. It's well intentioned, but the flaw in that, we can't remove the residual pressure drop across this ball valve. Now, granted, a ball valve, especially a full port ball valve is relatively low pressure drop. I think if I remember right, a, a full port ball valve is roughly two, two tenths of a foot or half a foot of pipe, something like that. But can you be assured that it's gonna be a full port ball valve? If it's a conventional port ball valve, that's going to have a slightly higher pressure drop. And again, the intent down here of these T's is to have as close to zero pressure drop as possible. So anything that you install, be it a ball valve or a length of pipe, anything you put in between those T's is going to add to that pressure drop and it's going to tend to want to push flow through that secondary circuit even when the circulator is off if your check valve is not strong enough. So rather than do that as your purging detail, this is the detail I, I recommend. It's simply use a purge valve on the return side of the secondary circuit. And what this would do is you would close the, the inline ball valve to purge it, put a hose on your, um, you know, your drain valve or your, your purging port. And what that's going to do is you're going to basically pressurize your primary loop first. It's going to force flow up through here because it's going to atmosphere at this point right here. So the, the air is still going to get pushed out of it right out through there. I put that as close as you can to this T. You, you still might have a tiny bit of air right here. That's going to that's going to be captured very quickly with a good air eliminator in the system. So put the T's as close together as possible. Put a purge valve on the return side of the secondary pump into the secondary and make sure you've got either the, the built-in spring check in the circulator or an external spring check or a flow check. And that that is a nice way to dress out all your secondary circuits. Okay, that's all I've got. Um, again, I, I just want to thank everybody that has tuned in today. We've got a still a good size audience here. Uh, next week is our wrap. I think you're going to find it very interesting. It's on the future of hydronics. And I, I will tell you, it's a bright future in my opinion. I think there's a lot of uh, trending going on in the industry, uh, not, not just the hydronics industry, the building industry and the energy industry in general. There's a lot of trending going on there that we can capitalize on in the hydronics industry. And uh, really, I, I think we have great potential to move the industry into higher market percentages based on this. Uh, we will have, I'll call it a surprise guest next week, who uh, I think will reflect on that as well. So uh, tune in next Monday. That'll be the 9th. Uh, again, we will start at 8 o'clock sharp. And uh, I hope to see you then. Yeah, just want to echo what John's saying. Obviously, we thank everybody participating in our ongoing training. Those of you looking for the handouts from previous uh, dates, they will be made available probably early next week. Um, I've put our YouTube channel into the main chat window as well as my email address. So if you're looking for previous videos, they'll appear on our YouTube channel. And if there's anything that John did not discuss uh, during this event, or you just have a general question on uh, anything we've talked about here or any products we've talked about, feel free to send me an email. Otherwise, John and I look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week. Stay well. Thank folks. you so much for joining us. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Take care.